This video is brought to you by Ground News. On Monday, the Pakistani army carried out what it described as intelligence-based anti-terrorist operations inside Afghanistan in retaliation to a lethal suicide attack on a Pakistani military outpost over the weekend. This didn't go down well with the Taliban, who responded by firing on Pakistani positions along the border with heavy weaponry and threatening further escalation. This is just the latest deterioration in Afghan-Pakistan relations, which have been on a downward spiral ever since the Taliban took power in 2021 and basically refused to kick out the Pakistani Taliban, the main terror group in Pakistan. So in this video, we're going to have a look at the recent flare-up, the wider downturn in Afghan-Pakistan relations and what might happen next. Before we start, if you haven't already, please consider subscribing and ringing the bell to stay in the loop and be notified when we release new videos. So, this story really started on Saturday, when a terrorist group attacked a Pakistani military outpost along the Pakistan-Afghanistan border in the region of North Waziristan. North Waziristan has a history of unrest and had previously acted as a sort of home for various Pakistani terror groups, most notably the Pakistani Taliban, but the army apparently reclaimed the area a few years ago. According to a statement by the Pakistani military, the group used suicide bombs and a vehicle laden with explosives, and the attacks resulted in the death of seven Pakistani soldiers. While the military didn't say who was behind the attack, a newly formed group, Jaish e Fursani Mohammed, has since claimed responsibility for it. Pakistan's newly crowned president, Asif Ali Zadari, vowed to respond strongly to the attack regardless of who it is or from which country the group came from. The army then announced that they were performing a clearance operation, but until Monday it was restricted to operations on the Pakistani side of the border. However, in the early hours of Monday morning, the Pakistani military launched a series of what it described as intelligence-based anti-terrorist operations aimed at targets inside Afghanistan, around the border towns of Paktika and Khost. Pakistani officials told Al Jazeera the attacks were aimed at the Pakistani Taliban, or TTP, who were the main terrorist group operating in Pakistan, implying this new group that claimed responsibility for Saturday's attack is just a front for the TTP. This didn't go down well with the Taliban, who criticised Pakistan for violating Afghanistan's territorial sovereignty and claimed the attack killed five women and three children. A few hours later, there were a series of skirmishes between the Taliban and Pakistani army troops along the border, apparently instigated by the Taliban. So what happens next? Well, even if this recent episode doesn't trigger a full-on conflict, Afghan-Pakistan relations have been going steadily downhill for a few years now, and it's hard to imagine that things are going to get better anytime soon. For context, despite nominally being a US ally, Pakistan quietly maintained relations with the Taliban in the 2000s and 2010s, and even occasionally provided support for Taliban fighters. There were quite a few reasons for this, but the main one was that Pakistan rightly suspected that the Taliban might end up returning to power when the US withdrew, and knew that they couldn't afford having bad relations with any future Taliban government. This was both because an unfriendly Taliban government on the border would be a source of constant irritation for Pakistan, but also because Pakistani officials hoped they'd be able to convince the Taliban to kick out the TTP, who'd been using Afghan territory as a base to carry out terror operations in Pakistan. Unfortunately for Pakistan, that's not what happened. The Taliban did mediate negotiations between the TTP and Pakistan, which led to a ceasefire from August until December of 2021. But once the ceasefire expired, the TTP stepped up its attacks against Pakistan, and the Taliban didn't do anything to stop it, with Pakistani officials even accusing the Taliban of supporting the TTP. Despite a brief ceasefire towards the end of 2022, TTP attacks have continued to escalate in the last few years, prompting Pakistan to occasionally carry out attacks inside Afghanistan, as it did on Monday in April of last year. Late last year, the dispute hit the international headlines when Pakistan's caretaker government abruptly announced that it would be deporting all undocumented Afghans living in Pakistan who hadn't voluntarily left by early November. For context, roughly 1.7 million Afghans live in Pakistan, with waves of migrants fleeing every Afghanistan conflict since the Soviet invasion. 
including some 600,000 who fled Afghanistan where the Taliban took back power in 2021. Deteriorating relations have also fueled a recurring dispute over the Afghan-Pakistan border, which has always been a point of tension between the two countries. The border is known as the Durand Line, and it was drawn by British imperialists in 1893. Like previous Afghan rulers, the Taliban refused to recognise the more than 2,600 km border with Pakistan, arguing that it artificially divides the Pashtun community. But Pakistan insists it's necessary for regional stability and the integrity of the Pakistani state. Since the Taliban takeover, there have been recurring clashes along the border, including clashes and skirmishes between the Taliban and Pakistani forces. So you get the point. Relations between Pakistan and the Taliban have been on a downward spiral for the past few years, largely because the Taliban haven't taken a strict line on the TTP as Pakistan would like. However, it's also possible that the recent uptick in tensions has been fueled by domestic dynamics within Pakistan. Last month's elections, where candidates aligned with former Prime Minister Imran Khan won a plurality of seats, were perhaps the most explicit rebuke of the Pakistani army's influence in Pakistan's politics in recent history. For context, the Pakistani army has always basically called the shots in Pakistani politics, and staged coups against any politicians who disobey them. This is sort of what happened to Imran Khan in late 2022, but instead of quietly fading into obscurity, Khan decided to fight back, publicly criticising the opposition and the army's undue role in Pakistani politics. The army basically banned him from running in last month's elections, but independent pro-Khan candidates still won a plurality, massively outperforming expectations and delivering a stunning rebuke to the army. It's possible that the army has become more willing to escalate against countries like Iran and Afghanistan, because they want to remind the Pakistani public that they rely on the army for their security, and therefore shore up their popularity and perceived legitimacy after the elections. While this makes some sense, it's nonetheless a risky strategy, for the simple reason that Pakistan simply cannot afford an actual conflict with, well, anyone at the moment, given its chronic political instability and apparently irresolvable economic woes. Now, as we mentioned, Afghanistan-Pakistan relations appear to be getting worse, and it'll be interesting to see how this story develops further. But lucky for you, our sponsor Ground News is your ultimate tool for easily navigating news coverage. Their app and website create really comprehensive story overviews on any topic, so you can easily compare how news is covered across the world and political spectrum. For every article reporting on a story, you'll see the source's political bias, how factual they are, and even who owns them. For example, let's look at today's story about Pakistan's airstrikes on Afghanistan. Not only can I see that there are 86 sources reporting on the story, but I can quickly identify which sources have a political bias according to ratings from independent news monitoring organisations. I can also see how the story is being reported across the political spectrum. 23% of the news sources lean left, while 32% lean right. And the cool thing is, I can also see how different headlines shape the story, reading the articles directly within the app with just a tap. I also especially like their blind spot feed, which shows you stories that are underreported by either side of the political spectrum. For example, if you lean right, you might have missed this story about the US House of Representatives voting on a TikTok ban. It's unlike any other news app you've come across, so go to ground.news forward slash TLDR or click the link down in the description to get 40% off unlimited access to their Vantage plan. That's only $5 a month to help an independent news platform working to make the media landscape more transparent.